him and the teaching ministry in Brazil when he goes in November. Also, the men's prayer breakfast and deacons meeting is set up for a week from this Saturday. We'll have uh, usual breakfast at 7.30 and then the deacons meeting later on. So we've been, uh, last time we had a, a, a tremendous group. We had about 16 or 17 men and we had some good discussion about scripture and a lot of people are reading through the Bible and have a lot of different questions, so we've been enjoying that. Also, um, information is all up on the website on the Israel trip and on the Washington, D.C. trip, so that is available. And then the memorial service for Sally Davis will be on Saturday morning, I believe. I don't have a time yet. Saturday morning on October the 14th, so be in prayer be in prayer for that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. Continue to be in prayer for uh, several of the people in the congregation who are still having to clean out their houses, buy new stuff, get everything taken care of. It's just something that goes on for, for sev several weeks, if not months. Uh, continue to pray for our nation. Continue to pray for... Uh, both the state and local government, they have a lot to deal with with this particular uh, aftermath of the hurricane. And above all, for the many opportunities that people have to give the gospel to those that are, have been going through difficult times. We know a pastor and his wife have a church on the other side of town down by Hobby Airport, and they have a huge number of people who are, just lost everything. They're most, mostly lower socioeconomic and uh, level and they never have had much and they've just been flooded out and lost their cars, lost everything they have. So there's a lot of folks in this city who are uh, having some very difficult times right now. So we need to be in prayer for, for them as well. Excuse, say that a little louder. Pray for the three Texas churches that are suing the government for, for support and being denied. The, the three? Churches. churches in Texas that are suing the government because they won't give funds to a church. They won't what? They won't give funds to a church. They won't give funds for a church to help? Okay. There are three, Alan said there's three churches in Texas that uh, are suing the government because they won't give them uh, funds in terms of uh, uh, flood survival. And flood recovery. And they were, and they were, uh, they were shelters. So they took and they were shelters for people as well, and things like that. Okay, remember to pray for them as well. Father, let's just uh, go to the Lord in prayer. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful we have this time to come together to fellowship around your word. We thank you that our fellowship is with you because of what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Father, we're thankful that as we confess sins, we're instantly forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. And Father, we indeed pray for our nation. These storms that have hit the country, Irma and Harvey, have uh, devastated uh, many areas of the country and many people and the federal government will be coming in with a lot of money. State government's coming in, and the money's not there because we're running such a deficit. So, Father, we need to pray 
for wisdom on the part of uh, the government, on the part of national, state, local leaders. We also pray for this situation that Alan mentioned about three churches in Texas that are suing the government because they were uh, places where uh, evacuees could go and shelters and they are uh, not receiving funds from the government because they're churches. So, Father, we need to pray that that would be settled as well as some of the other critical legislation that did not get passed in the special session. We need to pray for wisdom on the part of people to think in terms of what used to be just common sense. Now, Father, we pray for us as we study your word that as we hear the light of your truth, that we would respond to it, that our thinking would be overhauled and transformed, and that as your word illuminates us, we would come to a greater appreciation and understanding of all that you have done for us, especially in our salvation. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we are in 1 Peter 3.18, and there is so much that we can find in 1 Peter 3, this next section that goes from 3.18 down through 22. This is a crucial section, and it is uh, not a simple section. It is a complex section, and it has a number where the, where the major point is pretty simple, and that is that we are to endure unjust suffering in humility in the same way that our Lord Jesus Christ did. That is the sub-theme. That's why we have verse 18. But then what Peter does coming out of the end of verse 18 is to talk about uh, Jesus being made alive by the Spirit, in whom also he went and he uh, proclaimed something to the spirits in prison. And then it goes on, it relates this to Noah, and relates this to baptism, and the angels and these authorities, and it's, what does all this have to do with suffering? That's going to be an important question to talk about. There are, uh, in fact, there are a number of uh, interpretations that have gone down through church history that you just wonder what these people were reading and what their understanding was. I mean, the early church, early on by the second end of the second century, there was a dominant uh, interpretation that was prominent throughout most of the Middle Ages, and that was that this idea of Jesus going to preach to the spirits was understood to be a second chance offer of the gospel to those who lived before Noah and had rejected Noah's message. How they get that, I don't know, but that has been a dominant, dominant view that this was a second chance offer. Another odd ancient view was that the time when Christ preached to these spirits was at the time of Noah and through Noah, he was preaching to that sinful generation. Now, we understand this to mean that Jesus, after the crucifixion, went to Hades to proclaim his victory over sin and death to those angels who had left their first estate and had taken on the form of human bodies in Genesis 6, the sons of God, and that they were subsequently imprisoned as divine judgment, divine punishment at that particular time. So we have to uh, deal with all of these very, very interesting things. And if just dealing with some of those theological issues wasn't enough, there are several critical uh, textual problems in the passage. There are grammatical ambiguities, words that don't seem to be as clear in the Greek as we would like them to be, uh, these lexical vagaries. So it all adds up to difficulty in interpretation. So we're going to be in these five verses for more than one or two nights. <clears throat> 
basic questions that we need to address are just the questions if you've gone through the Bible study methods class, your basic questions that you ask in any passage, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those are the basics for any study. So when we apply that to this, we have to ask at the end of verse 18 just exactly what does it mean to be made alive by the Spirit. And that's a contrast to being put to death in the flesh, so we need to understand what that means. And then in verse 19, by whom, we believe that probably refers to the Spirit, he went and preached. Where did Jesus go? He went somewhere. Where did he go? Uh, What did he do when he got there? To whom did he make this proclamation? Who are these spirits in prison? And what did he say when he made this proclamation? And ultimately, we have to determine then, what does all of that have to do with Noah, with the ark, with them being saved through water, and with the baptism that is referenced in verse 21, and what does that have to do with anything, and that its connection through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Because ultimately, when we look at this passage, and you read this passage, we can't interpret it just as if it stands alone. It stands in a context, as we've seen, in an epistle where everything has to connect back to the basic theme of unjust suffering. So when we talk about this, we have to relate it back to that. We can't just take these five verses and start understanding them as if they exist in a vacuum. So that's going to be uh, fun as well. So let's start working our way through this. And in this, uh, tonight's lesson, we're going to focus on substitutionary atonement. There's really two key ideas in the first half of verse 18, and that has to do with substitutionary atonement. The idea of substitution is one idea, And the idea of atonement is a secondary idea. That's why I've underlined and italicized, excuse me, substitutionary in the opening slide because that's the key idea we need to focus on uh, this this, uh, evening. So 1 Peter 3.18 reads, For Christ also suffered once for sins, plural, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, the sentence doesn't end there, so we have to go on to verse 19. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, keeps going, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So when we look at verse 20, we have to understand that in Peter's thinking, that's all connected to his main idea is this unjust suffering that Christ went through. That is the explanation of the reason why we too should undergo unjust suffering without complaining or griping or any of those things. So let's start working our way through the passage. It starts off with the word for. Now, in, he, in, in English, we often use the word for in a lot of different senses. In fact, we're going to find it twice in this verse, and each for translates different Greek words and has completely different meanings. Isn't English fun? A word like for or in can have a whole range of meanings, and you have to figure out what they mean. But guess what? Hebrew is not any clearer. Neither is the Greek. That's why context is so important. I remember going to semin- when I started seminary and studying Greek, thinking, oh, it's going to be great, going to learn the original language and solve problems. Well, you may solve some problems, but you open up a whole other box of problems. So, starts off with the word hati, which is not the word hina, which is an explanation or giving a reason for something. It's very close in that idea. It has the idea of giving the cause, answering the question, why? And the question that is raised begins in verse 17, which also begins with a hadi. 
For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. And most people would say, well, why do I have to suffer at all? Right? And so Peter is saying, because Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. So you're not anything special because you're just and you're suffering in an unjust manner. So did the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the pattern for how we're to handle unjust suffering. For So he says, for this Christ also suffered once for all, the just for the unjust. And this takes us back actually to a previous passage where he is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in verse uh chapter 2 verse 21 where he says begins with the hati also for to this you were called because christ also suffered for us see this is the verse where you have two english fours but they reflect two different english i mean two different greek words the first four is a because to this you were called so god has called us to this this is part of our identity our purpose our destiny as believers because Christ also suffered for us. Same English, three-letter English word, but the second for is a translation of a word we'll hear again and again tonight, and that's this preposition, who pair. And who pair and one other preposition, uh, ante, are the two important prepositions for understanding substitution. And that is as we'll see, very important in understanding the nature of what is happening on the cross. This transaction that takes place is one that is substitutionary, but we'll get to that in just a, just a minute. So hooper is that, and it indicates that Christ also suffered on behalf of us or for us. So as Peter said in verse 21, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, He's basically saying the same thing again in 3.18. In fact, what we have is three different uh, Christological passages in 1 Peter that are important. 1 Peter 1, uh, 18 to 21 is important because we know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from our empty manner of life from the tradition of our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. That's your first Christological passage in Peter. The second one comes up in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 21 to 25, and again talking about Jesus, who is, who is totally just. He suffered for us, gave us an example, a quote from Isaiah 53, 9, he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So it, again, developing the theme that he is totally righteous and undeserving of his suffering. And then we get to the third major uh, major passage on Christology in verses 18 to 22. So, <clears throat> the third key word that we need to look at, or <clears throat> excuse me, the second key word that we need to look at here, for, was the first word we looked at in verse 18, is this word suffered. Now, I think everybody here knows what suffering is, but maybe you don't. Suffering here is experiencing adversity in the context this is an undeserved ad adversity and it's a serious adversity but there are all kinds of adversities and some people don't like to use the word suffering to describe their adversities but that's just arrogance talking because the bible describes a whole range of adversity as suffering some of it is extremely intense some of it is mild but whenever it has its source in in something or someone that is targeting us because of our Christianity, then it fits this kind of suffering that is related to the suffering of Jesus Christ. Now, the word that is translated suffering is the one in this light blue box over here on the, on the right, Pasco. 
uh, which has its basic sense of to suffer or to endure suffering. And this is a key word in 1 Peter. It's used 11 times. Whenever you have a short epistle of five chapters and a word is used 11 times, I mean a noun or a verb, that tells you this is important. And the repetition of that word tells us that this is a major theme in 1 Peter, that suffering is part of the spiritual life, but it is directed toward a goal and an important goal. So as we get into these verses, this is important to understand this. It's, I'm going to give you four basic summary points here. First of all, this relates to the basic argument of First Peter, that uh, we have to follow Christ's pattern in how we respond and react to unjustified suffering. The example of his unjustified suffering on the cross is our standard. That's our reference point. And that uh, what Peter develops here is directly related to understanding the biblical teaching or instruction or doctrine of of substitutionary atonement, understanding the just suffering in the place of the unjust. So second of all, the passage is designed to provide us a rationale for unjust suffering, so that when we encounter unjust suffering, undeserved suffering, we can then think through what that means. We can think it through in terms of what Christ went through, and that that's our pattern. That sets the SOP, the standard operating procedure, for how we are to respond to undeserved suffering. Third thing we see is that this transitions from the, uh, the, 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 the reason for our handling this goes to the cross, and it's, it's part of our transition from the f- phase two in this life to our being brought to God. See, Christ suffered the just for the unjust for the purpose that he might bring us to God. So that shows that Many times, suffering has a purpose that goes far beyond anything we might imagine. It has a, a universal and it has a spiritual and eternal impact that we can't fathom. And we get all upset and complain and gripe and get in a bad mood because something happens, and it may be something serious, when God is orchestrating it, so that it can work together for good with other things and bring about something glorious in his purpose that we may not understand until we get to heaven. And then we also see that as we look at this, that though that Christ went through unjust suffering, but it wasn't a defeat. The cross was not a defeat. Going through for Christ to go through this undeserved suffering was not a failure. It was a victory, and it gave him victory over sin and death, and that's going to be the content of his victorious proclamation when he uh, goes to the spirits in verse 19. So Christ's unjust suffering was not a defeat but a victory, and our undeserved suffering and our spiritual life is not a defeat. It's not a failure. It is a victory. It is our opportunity to have victory in that situation that is going to reverberate and resonate throughout all of history. And then we learn in this section that unjust suffering is connected to a testimony that we have in the angelic conflict and thus persevering in unjust suffering is victory over Satan and the fallen angels. We don't have victory in this superficial thing that's popular in a lot of churches about uh, spiritual warfare, taking dominion over Satan and all of that. We have victory by walking by means of the Spirit in the midst of undeserved suffering because that provides a testimony before the angels in this angelic conflict. And that's where Peter's going to go in these uh, these next four Uh, four verses. So it begins, for Christ also suffered. 
But there's a textual problem here. Now, a textual problem is when another word has entered into the manuscript tradition. So there are some manuscripts that don't have the word suffer there. They have the word that I've, I've put this down at the bottom of the screen to, so you can see the difference between the two words. The, one, the word that we have in the text is translated suffered, but there's a word in a number of manuscripts that is very similar. The only difference are two letters that enter in in the uh, second half of the word, instead of epithen, we find in some manners epithanin. Okay, so just two letter difference. But epithen, the word we have here is the word for suffering. It's the uh, aorist form of Pasco. And epithanin is the aorist, uh, aorist uh, for to die, epithanesco. So that is, so it doesn't mean that Christ suffered or Christ died. Well, you can look at it and you can say, well, either one could be true contextually, for Christ also died once for sins. That makes perfect sense. There's nothing uh, different theologically there. But contextually, when we look at what is being, it, the, this is an illustration. He's given a reason for why we go through unjust suffering, and not all unjust suffering includes death. So uh, epithen, suffering, is the broad category. Dying is just one form of suffering. The theme of First Peter is epithen, and that is in older manuscripts. It's in the majority of manuscripts, and it also makes much better sense contextually, and it's consistent with the author's vocabulary. So most textual critics take uh, epithen, and whether you're majority text or whether you're a critical text person, uh, epithen is the preferred choice there. Now, when we look at this idea of suffering, using the word pasco, that many times when we talk, we talk about Christ's death on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins. He died on the cross for our sins. We go on and on, and we use that more narrow term. But if you go back to the Gospels and other epistles, what we find is that the apostles and Jesus used a Pasco much more than they used die, uh, just the word died. For example, in Matthew 16, 21, uh, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and be killed. So that, it's a different word there for, for being killed. But you have the word pasco used by Jesus in Matthew 16, 21. He, um, in Matthew 17, uh, 21, you also have the word suffer when Jesus, uh, Matthew 17, 12, when Jesus says, likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And it's used in Mark 8.31 and Mark 9.12 and Luke 9.22 and Luke 17.25, Luke 22.15, 24.26 and 46, Acts 1.3 and Acts 17.3. So it's a very common word that Jesus used and that the apostles used to describe what was happening on the cross, not just his death, but the suffering that took place there. And so Christ also suffered for our sins. And then the next word is the word once. Now, this is an extremely significant word. As we see as we go through this, this verse, this is a verse that is pregnant with significance. Now, that imagery is one of someone who's about to give birth to something that is uh, quite robust. And that's what we see in this passage is there are so many ideas here that this verse has embedded in it that we really have to take it apart so we can fully understand and appreciate everything that's here. Christ also suffered once for sins. And this is the word hapax in the Greek and indicates something once or once for all. And theologically, it's an extremely important and significant uh, word because uh, there's a lot of debate in theological circles, especially between Protestants and Catholics, over this idea of Christ dying once. If you are from a Roman Catholic background, every week they celebrate Mass. 
and every week in the Mass, Christ dies again. If you go to a Roman Catholic church, you will discover that they have a cross, a crucifix, and on the cross is the Savior. He's still on the cross. He didn't die once for sins. He's dying again and again and again and again for sins. And that's one of the major errors and heresies in Roman Catholic theology, that Jesus didn't once for all settle the issue of sin by his death on the cross. It has to be ongoing. It's related to their failure to understand eternal security because it's not fully paid for yet. How do you know when you're saved, when you've got enough good works? You don't. Jesus has to keep dying for those week after week. You have to keep getting the benefits through the Mass, week after week after week. And in the Reformation, this was one of those terms that the Reformers camped out on, indicating that Christ's work on the cross was complete, sufficient, and finished, so that it's not repeated. When you go to a Protestant church, they don't have a cross, a crucifix, where Jesus is on the cross. They have an empty cross, because the Savior died once for all, and finished paying for sins on Golgotha. So Christ also suffered once for sins. Now we're going to get into some really fun stuff here and really crucial stuff here, stuff that if you're just reading in the English, you you sort of glance over because you just miss all of the uh, underlying things that are going on here. And once again, we find that word for, But this is not the word huper that we saw earlier. It's not the word hati. It's not the word hina. The English word here is an accurate translation, but it's translating a different preposition. It's translating this preposition here, peri, P-E-R-I. Christ also suffered once for sins. Now, the two prepositions in Greek that are important for understanding substitutionary atonement are huper, and anti, like antichrist, a substitute in the place of Christ. But this isn't anti, and this isn't huper, it's peri. So what in the world is going on here? Why do we have uh, Peter using the word peri here instead of huper? Actually, he does use huper, but in the next phrase, when he says the just for the unjust, the just in place of the unjust. So what's the difference between suffering once for sins, peri hamartion, and just for, in place of the unjust? What is, what's happening here? Well, one of the things we need to understand is that Peter understood the Old Testament better than you or I do, but his understanding of the Old Testament was primarily not a Hebrew text, but the Greek text, and the Greek text that he used was called, we call the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was, according to legend, was translated by 70 rabbis in 70 days, or at least the, the Torah was, the Pentateuch. And the word for 70 is pentas, uh, Pentateuch, so that's where they get that term. I mean, excuse me, not Pentateuch, but Septuagint, Septa for, for 70. And so the Septuag- Septuaginta, was the 70, so that's what it was named for. Now, when they translated some of the Old Testament, these 70 rabbis understood Hebrew, and they understood uh, the the target language they were translating to, and they used this word, uh, peri. Peri, peri hamartion, because they understood something. And what they understood is that in the Old Testament, When you're reading that boring section as you read through the Bible and you read about the burnt offerings and you read about the trespass offerings and you read about the uh, sin offerings and the grain offerings and all of those different things, it it has, we'll look at a couple of verses here, several different uh, terms in English, phrases in English to communicate that idea of substitution or with reference to something or Uh, concerning something. And the Greek phrase that they translated, that they used to translate that was perihamartion. So Peter is showing his understanding and relating Christ's suffering on the cross 
to the sin offering in the Old Testament. And he remember, he's writing to Jewish background believers. They're going to understand that also. You and I are Gentiles, and you've read this maybe 5, 10, 15 times in your life. You've heard this verse quoted, and you didn't have a clue it had anything to do with Leviticus, did you? See, that's the problem with being a goy. We're just not educated well enough to pick up on these things. But the Holy Spirit wants us to pick up on these things. So it should be translated, as I have it here in the slide, uh, for is a simple way, but a little more precise would be concerning or with reference to sins. Christ not only died for sin, the principle of sin, Adam's original sin, but he also died, paid the penalty for sins in the plural. That is all personal sins. His suffering was with reference to sins. Now, he's not dying in the place of sin, so it wouldn't be right to use a substitutionary part, uh, preposition there, but it is correct in the next phrase. It is someone who is just suffering and dying for someone who is unjust. It's unjustified suffering, and that's the theme of Peter. That's what Peter wants us to talk about and think about is how we respond to undeserved and un unjustified suffering. So... Now, in this slide, I'm just reinforcing the idea that this phrase, peri hamartion, was used with reference to sacrifices, for example, of the Old Testament. In Hebrews 5.3, the writer of Hebrews, who is uh, pro very, writing to Jewish background believers who were formerly priests, so these would be people who really knew the, the laws of sacrifices. They were part of the priesthood. They had a Levitical background. And so there are a lot of things in Hebrews that relate to the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. In Hebrews 5.3, we read, because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself. That he's talking about the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He has to offer sacrifices for sins. So he's tying what Je the writer of Hebrews is tying what Jesus did to the, what ha happened at the Day of Atonement. Same thing happens in Hebrews 10, 26, for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. That goes to the, uh, the in unintentional versus intentional sinning of the, uh, it's dealt with by the, um, uh, on the Day of Atonement. It pays for the, the uh, unintentional sins. Also Leviticus 5.6. Now, we're going to take a minute to think about Leviticus 5, 6. In fact, you might turn in your Bibles to Leviticus. So we'll go back to the Old Testament. And I've recently discovered that, that you know, I, I've always thought that, that I'm somewhat of a dinosaur, but now I'm a heretic. That amongst the modern church growth people, Apparently, there's two things that they really don't like. They don't think you need to go to the Old Testament at all, that, that, that just teaching the Old Testament is something akin to being a Judaizer. So uh, that's what you get in a lot of these evangelical uh, sort of uh, brand X churches. The other thing is wearing a coat and tie. In fact, I've recently heard that there's a whole lot of these big television evangelists because the whole move is to be as casual as you possibly can. If you're wearing sandals and cutoffs and a t-shirt for your Sunday morning service, you're overdressed. And apparently, uh, Joel Osteen wears a coat and tie every Sunday. And so all of these church growth pastors are banding together to convince him that that's somehow heretical, that he shouldn't do that. This is where our culture is going. Rather than the church being setting a standard to raise everybody up out of the gutter, the church is setting the standard to lower everybody into the gutter and to dumb everything down so that Christians are even uh, less informed than non-Christians. So we're going to look at the Old Testament because it's important for understanding the New Testament. And in Leviticus chapter 5, 
we have the trespass offering and the description of the trespass offering. And we're just going to highlight a couple of words and terms that are used here. And it starts off in the beginning in the first five verses talking about what happens if a person does a variety of different things that render them ritually unclean. Now, I just want to remind you of this because a lot of people don't understand this. And they think that ritual uncleanness equals a sin. But that's not true. If you touch a dead body, if your mother or father dies and you fall down weeping on their carcass, that would render you uh, spiritually unclean. But that's not a sin. If you eat shellfish, if you were to eat shrimp or lobster or crab, that would make you spiritually unclean. If you had a bacon cheeseburger, that would render you spiritually unclean. But that's not a sin. There's a difference between ritual uncleanness and sins. But ritual uncleanness is designed in a uh, picturesque way to teach about sinfulness, that many of these things that make you ritually unclean are all related to the consequences of sin, and, and sin separates us from God. So ritual uncleanness teaches about separation from God whenever we sin. That's the spiritual reality. So the sacrifices all had to do with restoring ritual fellowship with God. Uh, burnt offerings and trespass offerings and sin offerings had to do with restoring their fellowship with God. They're already saved, but they have to become cleansed of sin so that they can go into the tabernacle or the temple in order to worship God. Now, that's very, very important. But if you're like David and you're out with the sheep down by Bethlehem, you can't start running back and forth to the temple or the, ta excuse me, the tabernacle every time you sin to get back in real fellowship with God. So he would confess his sin out there with the sheep, and he would be back in fellowship with God. But the next time he came to the tabernacle, before he could worship, he would have to be ritually cleansed. And one of the things, of course, that is a picture of that in Israel and uh, in, in the temple was the, the mikvah. And the plural is mikvahot. And the, you, there are a number of mikvahot outside the, the, uh, on the Temple Mount that, that have been discovered. And it was a bathing chamber. And, and you would walk down one, the steps on one side and immerse in the water to become ritually cleansed. And then you'd come up the other side. You wouldn't walk up the side where your tainted, corrupt footsteps were. You have to come up on, on the clean side. And so that's a picture of confession, a picture of being cleansed from sin before you, uh, before you can, can worship. And it's interesting, there was a news article uh, last week that there was a, a Haredi family. You know, Haredi means, that's a, a Hebrew term for ultra-Orthodox. So there is a Haredi family that is in one of the American Virgin Islands, and they had a Chavad, which is an ultra-Orthodox synagogue. And so they went into the Chavad, and they got the whole family into the mikveh, and they rode out the storm and were saved because they took shelter in the mikveh. I just thought that was amusing. So there's all these rituals for cleansing in the Old Testament, and that's what we have in Leviticus 5, 6. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin. Okay, now that for his sin is going to be translated in the Sept Septuagint with peri. For his sin, which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid or the goats as a sin offering. So he brings a trespass offering with reference to his sin, the right offering. And then the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. Now that is also probably translated peri. Sometimes it's not always that way, and I'm not working through my Hebrew text while I'm up here to get every preposition absolutely correct. Because a lot of these words, have, some of these words don't even have a preposition with them. And they also use some different ones. So what we have here, the key word that we're going to look at eventually, because we're talking about substitutionary atonement, is this word, make atonement. 
And if you've been around Christianity for very long, you will hear, and still if you look up in Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old Testament Words, or you look it up in some other older Hebrew dictionaries, it will give the meaning for kafar as covering or atonement. Okay, now what we need to figure out is, does it ever mean, does it mean atonement or covering in these passages? Now we get that picture maybe of blood being placed on the, on the, uh, um, uh, on top of the mercy seat as a covering. But this word kafar is used, in English we have words, we have homonyms, words that sound alike, like here and here, H-E-A-R and H-E-R-E. And you, but you also have words that are homophones. They're, they're spelled the same, but they have different meanings. And in Hebrew, you have one word that they pretty much determined kafar is a different word, different root, but it means pitch, like the pitch that uh, Noah covered the ark with, not the ark of the covenant, but his ark, uh, the big boat that he survived the flood in. And here you have a different word, but it is spelled the same, and it means, and it's translated into English atonement. Well, what we'll see when we get there is that's a made-up word. It is made up from three English words, at one meant. So it is the idea of bringing two people together, bringing man and God together in reconciliation. And so it was a theological word that the Brits just made up. And during the Reformation, how are we going to translate this? But we have to understand that most of the time in the Hebrew, the word atonement is translated into the Greek Septuagint by the word katharizo, which means cleansing. Sometimes it's even translated forgiveness. It means to wipe the slate clean. And so now this person is ritually clean. That's what's going on here. We're going to talk about this more and more. So the priest makes atonement from the sin offering with reference to his sin. He's forgiven. It's the idea of cleansing and forgiveness, and that's what's embedded, uh, embedded in that word. So we have this a number of places, like Exodus 30, verse 10. Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns. That's on the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, or, excuse me, on the um, uh, altar once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It's most holy to the Lord. This is the word kafar again. It's found in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. And he shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them. Now we think of for them as substitutionary, but it has this preposition all. Now I think it was Tuesday night when I was going through uh, Psalm 18 that we saw this same preposition. And I gave you a quote from one of the Hebrew dictionaries that said there's about 30 different ways this preposition is translated. That's what I mean by ambiguity. So how do you understand? Well, one of the various ways in which al is translated is the idea of for or in place of something or concerning something. So this is that same idea. So it runs all the way through these first eight or nine chapters in Leviticus for the most part. So what we're looking at now is this question of what does the Bible teach about substitutionary atonement? And first we have to talk about substitution. I ran across this little cartoon today that I thought might communicate if you're falling asleep. It's somebody's playing charades and they unroll their little piece of paper and, as, and it says at the bottom, as Leon unfurled the piece of paper, which says substitutionary atonement on it, he swore he would never again play charades with ministers. So as we look at substitutionary atonement, we're going to start with the word substitution, and then we'll take up the word atonement. So under the first point, which has nine subpoints, okay, we're going to define what substitution is, and then we'll define what atonement is. Are we having fun yet? There are some great passages here. This is just rich stuff to understand what's going on on the cross. Substitution in our theology refers to Christ dying in our place. He replaces us so that he pays our penalty in our behalf. Uh, 
Uh, we often see the idea of substitution in sports, where one player is taken out of the game and somebody else is substituted. But the person that is, subs that, that is taken out of the game doesn't get credit for what the person who, who is his substitute does. That's the difference with what happens on the cross. Jesus goes in as our substitute, and we get credit for what he does. That's the difference. So, this is a much richer idea of substitution. So, the first point we want to make here is that there ha we're explaining why we have to have substitution. Now, let me say something. I put this at the end rather than at the beginning, but it took almost a thousand years for the church to really figure out that Christ's atonement was substitutionary. So first point is that God's perfect righteousness and his absolute justice demand a substitute for us that meets his righteous standard. We can't die for ourselves. But yes, we have to have someone else die for us, someone who can give us perfect righteousness because we are just basically out of luck. We have a deficit in our bank account. It's not even zero. It is minus a billion. And we have to be given something that has positive credit to wipe out our debt. That's the language that Paul uses in Colossians 2, 12 and following, that the certificate of debt against us is nailed to the cross. It is wiped out by Christ's, by Christ's death. So God's perfect righteousness and his absolute justice demand a substitute for us that meets his righteous standard so that his absolute justice can be satisfied. Now that's the word propitiation. Propitiation means to be satisfied. That's an important doctrine. It's a word that is not, you can go to a lot of churches, you'll never once hear a sermon on propitiation. You probably will never hear the word uh, used at all and that's really very, very sad. But what I'm pointing out here is that substitution isn't only related to atonement, which is what we think about. It's related to propitiation. What we're going to see is it's related to several other dimensions of, of what Christ does on the cross. So, so it's related to propitiation here and the satisfaction of God's justice. Now, because God can't look on or have fellowship with or have a relationship with dirty, rotten, corrupt sinners. And that's Habakkuk or Habakkuk 1.13, where in his opening prayer, uh, Habakkuk says, you, talking to God, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. That's the point. God can have nothing to do with that which is sinful and that which is corrupt. So something has to stand in our place if we're going to have a relationship with God. Under the second point, B, Scripture teaches that all human beings have sinned and are thus under the judgment of God. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned, that's personal sin. We've also sinned in Adam, that's Adam's original sin, but we've also sinned personally on, on our own. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now that term glory of God was often used as a, as a figure of speech for God's entire essence, for everything that God is. That's his glory. And so when you read this, it, what he's saying is everybody has sinned and they fall short of God's character. We have to live up to God's character or we can't have any kind of relationship with him. Third thing, point C, is that the only way we can stand before God is if we possess his perfect righteousness. So how are we going to get his perfect righteousness? Well, that is what's called imputation. So what we're seeing here is not only is substitution related to propitiation, it's also related to, to imputation, that is the crediting of Christ's righteousness to us. We'll see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 as well. So under point D, this demands a cleansing or a purification. Now that's really the idea of kafar. And, and that was, and you can demonstrate that. I'll go through that probably next week. But that is so important to understand what atonement is. It's this 
idea of a cleansing. In the Old Testament, those animal sacrifices provided a ritual cleansing or purification. But what we need is a real cleansing or purification so that we can have a standing before God. The Old Testament illustrates this concept of substitution through a series of sacrifices that are substitutionary in nature. You have the burnt offering, we have the grain offering, we have the sin offering and the trespass offering. All of these offerings relate to substitution. For example, in Leviticus 1, 3 and 4, we see the imagery. If his offering is a burnt offering, so the first chapter deals with burnt offerings. If his offerings are burnt off, uh, a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. See, it has to picture a perfect savior. Uh, a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Now, it's not burnt yet. Okay, he t brings in the bull and he puts his hand hand on his head and he recites his sins now aren't you glad you don't have to do that see all we have to do is close our eyes and in silent prayer uh, identify and admit our sins to God but this is no indication this is necessarily silent prayer it may have been he puts his hand on the head of the burnt offering and he confesses his sin and they're transferred from him to that poor innocent bull. I'll never forget the first time I was in Israel watching a film they have at the uh, entrance to the southern gates uh, at the Temple Mount, and they show this, this film of what it was like for a, someone in the second temple period to be traveling during one of the feast days to Israel, and they have this man walking in with his lamb. And this lamb has these doe eyes, just brown eyes, and this lamb hasn't done anything. It's, it's, should, it's totally blameless, and yet, and you just get that picture of that's what the Lord was like, just a lamb has not done anything. It's not worthy of any condemnation whatsoever. It's just the sweetest, nicest, innocent lamb and yet you're going to put him on the altar, put your hand on his head, recite your sins, and then kill that lamb because of what you did. Or kill the bull because of what you did. That is a graphic picture. Every time you come to worship, you've got to do that. It is a constant reminder that your sins deserve death. That's the picture. So he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. There's this transfer. That animal is a substitute for what should happen to him. And it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Now, what's interesting is that you look at that in the English where it says it will be accepted on his behalf. That does not translate a Hebrew word. It translates the, what's there, the context, it translates what, what actually is there is a preposition men and probably has the idea of separation from. That's what men's primary meaning is, is from or separation. So it would have to be this, this men plus kafar indicates a separation from the sin in, in the cleansing. But you also have some of the prepositions are translated with the phrase that we're studying, which is peri homertion, which should be understood as for, for or concerning or with reference to sins. And it denotes, as, as the uh, Bauer Danker Arndt Gingrich Greek lexicon says, it denotes the object or person to which or to whom an activity or especially an inward process refers or relates about or concerning. So that's the idea. It's Christ is dying with reference to or concerning sins, the personal sins. And, and it also indicates in a number of contexts, it's used, it takes the place of huper. Um, so that gives you that, that idea. So Leviticus 5, 5, and 6, and it shall be when he is guilty in any of these manners, that he, in any of these matters, 
that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. There's confession. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin. That's one that doesn't have a preposition there, just probably a, uh, I'll show you in just a minute, probably just a, a, a lamed. Uh, for his sin, which he had, has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning or with reference to a sin. That would have been translated with peri. Then we go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, clearly indicates substitution. You can read all the way through Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, the Messiah. And again and again, you have the idea of substitution there. In Isaiah 53, 5, notice how many times you get the idea of substitution. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's the preposition men. I mentioned it a minute ago. It has to do with some sort of separation. It was just the idiom in which they express substitution. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He gets the punishment. The Messiah, Jesus, the Lamb of God on the cross gets our punishment for what we've done. He's bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace, that is our peace with God, was upon him and by his stripes we are healed talking about salvation. That's not talking about getting healed from the flu or a cold or a backache or one leg being shorter than the other. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him. And all it says is the Lord upon him iniquity. Okay, and that preposition all carries the weight of, to communicate the idea of substitution. But Jesus clearly understood that Isaiah 53 referred to him. And he says that in Luke 22:37. 37. He says, For I say to you that this which is written, and he quotes from Isaiah 53, must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So he is connecting Isaiah 53 and its fulfillment to himself. Now the next point, which is G, I've got two more after this one. The Passover lamb imagery shows that the lamb died in the place of the firstborn. Remember the Exodus story? There's been nine plagues, and the Egyptian culture's been decimated, but now it's really going to be, be rocked because God is going to take the life of the firstborn in every family and the firstborn of all the cattle and all the sheep. But there's a way to avoid the death penalty, and that is to kill a lamb that is without spot or blemish, the idea of substitution. And if they would kill a lamb that was without spot or blemish and put that blood on the doorposts of the house, then those who were in the house would be spared. And instead of the firstborn son being killed by, by God, the lamb was killed. It's the perfect picture of substitution, the Passover lamb. And that's applied to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven. That was ritual cleansing. The day of unleavened bread starts the day after Passover, and you remove all the leaven from the house. It's a picture of confession that you may be a new lump, since you, are tr you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed to us. That just connects him right to that, just as John 1.29 does, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So it's this idea of substitution again and again and again. Now, the H, which is the eighth point, Christ uh, presents himself to serve God and mankind by giving his life as a payment price. In Mark 10, 45, we have Jesus saying, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, this ransom's a payment price. Somebody gets kidnapped, somebody's captured in battle, then you have to pay it off. 
And it, it is a, a function of substitution, the money for the person. And the preposition that's used here is the other preposition for substitution, anti, which means in place of or instead of. Huper and anti are the two big prepositions for understanding substitution. Now, last century, late 19th, early 20th century, one of the foremost Greek scholars was Archibald T. Robertson. His Greek grammar, which sits at home, totally unused now, is about this thick. It's unused because I have it electronically and it's much more usable. <laughs> but it is this thick. It is probably weighs about two pounds. And he also wrote a five-volume work that is very accessible to most people, and it's called Word Pictures of the New Testament. And he says there about anti, he says, there's the notion of exchange also in the use of anti, one thing exchange for another, or substitute for another. And he says, those who refuse to admit that Jesus held this notion of substitutionary death. See, this is what most liberal theologians believe. Your friends who go to a Methodist, Episcopal, and some Presbyterian churches, and many Catholics, do not believe in a substitutionary tone. When they say Jesus died for you, they say Jesus died, to, what they mean is Jesus died to give you a picture of how you should be devoted to your own cause just as he was devoted to his cause. Or Jesus died as a moral example to you about how you should clean up your life. That's what they mean. So what you hear, when you hear your friends say, oh, I believe Christ died for me, you think that they're actually going to go to heaven because they believe in substitutionary atonement. Well, they don't because they've never heard of substitutionary atonement. They've been taught from some pantyways preacher who just believes in the moral view of the atonement, that Jesus has given you a good example of how you can live and straighten out your own life. It's pure legalism, and it's a gospel that's going to send them straight to hell. We'll look at that next time. This is the kind of people that A.T. Robertson's talking about. Those who refuse to admit, liberal theologians, liberal pastors, that Jesus held this notion of a substitutionary death, take an easy way to get rid of passages that contradict one's theological opinions. They rewrite the meaning. Okay, the last point, the preposition who pair with the genitive. Luke twenty two nineteen. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them. We hear this once a, once a month. This is my body which is given for you. It's the preposition who pair. It's given in place of you. It's given as a substitute for you. Romans 5.8, another verse you've heard many, many times, but God demonstrates his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us as a substitute for us. It's the word who pair. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin in our place, sin for us. It's substitutionary. And then uh, the last point, I, 1 John 2, 2 relates this substitution to the idea of propitiation. We saw that at the very beginning, 1 John 2, 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. It's the preposition peri, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Not for ours means not just for believers only, but for everyone. It is an unlimited atonement. Now next time we're going to define the word atonement. And then when we get done you might have an idea of what substitutionary atonement means. And it's an important, important concept. It's at the heart of the gospel because Jesus has died in our place and paid our penalty. Father, we thank you for explaining so well an imagery of sacrifices and of the Lamb, what it means to have a substitute, to have our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. He died in our place. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, the spotless Lamb of God without sin was punished so horribly because we sinned. And Father, that is the core of the gospel that because he took our punishment upon himself,
we can have eternal life by simply trusting in him, accepting him as our Savior. Father, we pray that you would help us to assimilate that which we've learned tonight, we've heard, and that we can mull it over and think it over and come to a greater understanding of what it means when we say that Jesus died for us, that he is our substitute. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.